King Darius I decided to march against the Scythians. And so he was marching towards them with intentions of destroying them and taking over their land. And he got a message back from the Scythians. And it was a simple message. It was a, mo a mouse, a frog, a bird, and five arrows. And he got all excited and he said, Yes, the five arrows means that they're going to lay down their arms before me. The mouse means that we get their land. The frog means we get their water. And the bird, mean, the bird means that they're going to flee from before us. And his trusty advisor said to him, King, perhaps there's another interpretation. He said, perhaps the mouse means unless you dig into the ground and bury yourself to protect yourself, or you do like the frog and you get in the water to protect yourself, or you do like the birds and you turn around and you fly away, the arrows of the Scythian army will annihilate you. And King Darius said, hmm, I like that one better. I think we'll turn around and go home. You see, interpretation is everything. How you interpret things is very important. Marla Maples, the other woman in the Ivana Donald Trump breakup, when she was interviewed, she talked about her religious roots. And I know you might look at that and say, really? But um, she did. And she talked about that she believed in the Bible, but she said, you can't take all of the Bible literally and be happy. Interpretation is everything. Interpretation is important. You know, when we interpret the, the scriptures, we need to look at what the context is that the speaker's speaking in or the writer wrote in. We have to look at what it says. And we don't then say, well, I got this other idea over here and so... I think maybe it means this, even though it's clear what it's saying it means, it may mean this over here, or it could mean that, or it, it, it could mean that, but we do have to look at the history of it and the background of it, who the speaker was, who his audience was, and all of those things put together to interpret what is being said. Because interpretation is everything. In Luke 21, we want to look at that this morning. We want to look at the fact that the context of Luke 21 is the destruction of Jerusalem. It's the destruction of the Jewish economy. I want you to hear something that some people don't believe today. But in Galatians chapter 3, and starting in verse 28, Paul said, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now Paul didn't say actually that you're not a male or a female or that you not, don't have a nationality anymore. He's not saying that. But he's saying all of that stuff doesn't count when it comes to salvation because salvation is in Christ and it's for everyone. And so he says, and if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Why would he say that? I believe Paul was saying, it's not about being a Jew anymore. It's not about being a Gentile anymore. It's not whether you're a man or a woman, but it's all about that you are in Christ Jesus, a Christian. That's what it's all about. And so he said that, but I want to look at Luke chapter 21 because that really does get messed around with interpretation sometimes. Luke 21, Jesus is there with his apostles and he says to his apostles, he says, you know, they're standing around and, and he looks at, at, they're looking at the temple and they said, look at how beautiful the temple, look at the beautiful stones it's made of, and all of those things. And, and he said, listen, I'm telling you, the time is coming when there won't be one stone left on another here. 
that temple will be destroyed. And then he goes on and he says, um, they say, well, when's this going to happen? And Jesus said, well, there's going to be rumors of wars and there's going to be persecution and you're going to be dragged before the, the leaders and, and all of these things. And that's not it yet. Don't worry about it. But there's, those are all some signs. But he says, when you see the army of the Romans, of the Gentiles, camping around Jerusalem, get out. Get out of the city. Don't get trapped in there. He says, when you see the abomination of desolation, that is the sign. That's time to get out. And so he's preaching to the apostles, or he's telling the apostles, he's saying, no harm's going to come to you. You're going to give me, te you're going to testify about me and all of these things. But there will be all of these things happening. But that isn't the time yet. But when that army comes, when they are encamped around the city of Jerusalem, he says, that's the time. That's when you're going to see the Son of Man coming on the clouds. And he's not talking literally about Jesus floating on the clouds. That's not what he's talking about. But he's saying, you're going to see everything I'm saying as king is going to happen. And you're going to see my power displayed there. Because I'm telling you, this is what's going to happen because it's what God has set in order. And, I, and you look and you read through Luke 21 and, and it says those things. And it's equivalent to Matthew chapter 24. Now if you're aware of this at all today, about different teachings of the Bible, and it isn't necessarily a great interpretation of it, a lot of people take Matthew 24 and Luke 21 and what they want to do is instead of taking it in Jesus' time, they want to take it and move it future. And they want to say, this is talking about the end of the world. Now, you have to do some pretty good finagling with the context and with, with um, the, the, a lot of things in this scripture, and I'll show you in a minute why. But you have to do a lot of finagling with things to get that interpretation. And, but they do. They, they, they say, well, there's going to be signs. And these are the signs. And, and you'll hear people today say, we're in end times. The signs are all there. The wars, all of these things. They're all there. Well, if you understand what Jesus said about his second coming in Scripture, he says it's going to come as a thief in the night. No, 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 there won't be any signs. He didn't even know. Only the Father knew. And so why are they looking for signs? Why are they trying to make this talk about future when it's talking about signs of something that's going to happen? I'll tell you why. Because they don't read all of the Scripture. You see, in Luke chapter 21... And in verse 32, Jesus made a statement that pretty much clarifies everything that he was talking about. He said, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all has taken place. And I want to break that down for you a little bit. This generation... When I say this generation, how do you understand that? You understand that, that it's the generation I'm living in. When Jesus said this generation, he meant the same thing. And so he said, in this generation, now I've got to ask you a question. If we move this future, how many people do you know that were living in the days of Jesus that are still living today? Because that'd be a long generation to last, wouldn't it? But Jesus said, this generation will not pass away. This generation won't be over, won't be through until all these things take place. And Luke is a little clearer than Matthew because Luke actually says when you see the army encamping the city. Matthew says when you see the abomination of desolation, which is what the Roman army was referred to by the Jews, was an abomination. They were, the Gentiles were an abomination and their armies destroyed everything they came across and so they were the abomination of desolation. 
but it's saying the same thing. And so Jesus said in that generation those things would take place. <clears throat> so it's pretty clear that he was talking about A.D. 70 when the temple was destroyed, when Jerusalem was overrun and ceased to exist as the city of Jerusalem. And the reason he did all of that, the reason God did all of that was because it was not about Jew or Gentile or man or woman or anything anymore. It was about being one in Christ Jesus. That's it. And the, the, Judy, the Jews didn't understand that. But that's the context. And so he says, be aware of this. It's going to happen. And then he says, stay alert. In Luke chapter 21 um, and verse uh, 34, starting verse 34, he says, Watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and cares of this life, and that day come upon you suddenly like a trap, for it will come upon all who dwell on the face of the earth. He says, Don't be weighed down, stay alert. Dissipation, dissipation there is the idea of eating gluttonously to the point that you're so full you can't move. It's just like, bleh, you just feel like that and you can't move. He says, don't be overindulging in things. Don't be doing those kinds of things as if there's nothing wrong and nothing's going to happen. Don't get all of, don't let that, don't get caught up in that. And he says, don't get caught up in drunkenness. So don't be intoxicated and don't be um, out of control and, and don't be managed and manipulated by other things. Be in self-control and be alert. Be alert that this is going to happen. And then he says, and don't let the cares of life weigh you down. You know... People get caught up on a lot of things in life. And they don't realize that all they really need to get caught up on is Jesus. But they get caught up on everything else but Jesus. They get caught up on money and chasing money. And, they, and, and it costs them their lives a lot of times. They get caught up on chasing material things and toys and, and, and whatever else is out there. And they get caught up on health. And I'm not saying you shouldn't be healthy and you shouldn't strive to be healthy. But if you're trying to be healthy and you're not caught up in Jesus, your health isn't going to benefit you anything. So don't let those concerns all weigh you down, is what Jesus is saying. He said it another way in another passage. He said they'll be eating and they'll be drinking and they'll be doing all kinds of things, giving in marriage and taking in marriage, all those things, and it's going to come upon you. So don't let those things rule your life. Let Jesus rule your life. Let Him be the focus of your life and don't get weighed down by these things because it's going to happen. And so He says, don't get caught unawares because it's going to happen. It's going to happen suddenly. That idea of a thief in the night. You see, the Jews were in Jerusalem, were living it up, thinking they had God's protection, believing they were God's people, and, and they were living it up. And when the Roman army came, they were living it up so much that they never realized they were in peril. And one day they looked out and they went, how did this happen? Rome's marching on us and, and they're getting over the walls and we're getting destroyed. It was too late. That's what happened to Jerusalem. He said, don't get caught unawares because it's going to be like a trap. You know, when you did catch birds, they set up a net and no one can see that net except the ones that set it up because they can know it's there. But they set that net up and the birds come along and they spring and that net flies up like this and before those birds even have a chance, they're in the net. 
And that's what he's talking about here. He said it's going to be that quick and you're caught. So be alert, stay alert. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and starting in uh, verse 13 he says, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, though Jesus, through Jesus, sorry, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not proceed, will not proceed those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry, of command with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of a trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first then we who are alive who are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so we will always be with the Lord therefore encourage one another with these words but then he says, now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there's peace and security and then suddenly destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day, for that day to surprise you like a thief. So, he says there's not going to be any signs <laughs> when Jesus returns. But why do we make this the signs of Jesus returning? Because we don't have the correct interpretation. And so he says the coming of Christ will be like a thief in the night. We won't know. We don't know the time. There's no sign. How many people here have ever had a thief break into their house, first phone them and say, hey, we're going to break into your house and this is the time we're going to break into your house. And here's the sign for you to watch. They don't do that because they don't want you to know that they're breaking into the house. And that's Jesus' point. You don't know when he's coming. And he said it's going to come on the whole face of the earth or everyone who lives on the face of the whole earth. But that's not whole earth as we understand it, because in the, with the Jews, and with what Jesus was teaching, he was talking about the known world to them, which was really the Roman Empire at that time. Because Rome was considered to run or to rule over the world. But we know for a fact, they didn't rule over every piece of land in the world. And so Jesus is saying what you call the world, everyone there will know it. And believe me, everyone knew when Rome destroyed Jerusalem. Everyone knew it. And so Jesus says, be alert and be astute. In other words, stay awake. Stay awake at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place, to stand before the Son of Man. It's an interesting statement that Jesus makes there, because he's talking not about the end of the world, but he's talking about the end of the Jewish economy, the end of the Jews as a nation. And he says, this is all going to happen to Jerusalem, and I want you to stay awake at all times. Be expectant for this to happen. He's warning them. He's not warning about the end of the world. He's warning them because remember that generation wasn't going to pass away till these things happened. So he's warning them to expect this to happen because it's going to happen. So he's saying, be on your guard. Live your lives accordingly, knowing that this is going to happen. You need to be watching out all the time. In Matthew chapter 25, and starting in verse 1, Jesus tells a parable. And if I can find that in here, I will find it. <laughs> he tells a parable about the ten virgins. And he says, the kingdom of heaven will be like. So whenever he starts a parable, and he says, the kingdom of heaven will be like. He's now going to give an illustration of what it's going to be like. 
what heaven's going to be like. So he says it'd be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. We talked about that this morning in Proverbs. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. In other words, five of them figured, we better make sure we're well equipped because we don't know how long this is going to be. And the other five thought it was going to happen right away and they, didn't get, they weren't prepared for it. So as the bridegroom was delayed, the bridegroom being Jesus in this parable, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. And if you understand Jewish weddings, that would happen. They would be sitting and waiting, and oftentimes they got married down by the sea, on the beach by the sea. And so they'd be waiting, and when the bridegroom showed up, they'd all come running out with their lamps and walk the bridegroom in. And so it says that all the virgins rose and, and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered saying, since there will be not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourself. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. And that's exactly what happened in a Jewish wedding. And Jesus says, learn from that, that you need to be prepared for the coming of Christ. And so Jesus is saying to these people here in Luke chapter 21, he's saying you need to have that preparedness because this destruction is coming on Jerusalem. And so he said, here's how you're going to beat it. You pray. Have you heard that before? Jesus say, you need to pray. Jesus prayed. In the garden, Jesus prayed for strength to get through what he had to go through. He didn't rely on his own power. He relied on God. And he said, Father, you get me through this. Jesus prayed often. He prayed when he called Lazarus out of the grave. He prayed that the Father would bring him out so that those people would know that he's God. Jesus prayed and he says here to the apostles, you need to pray, Luke 21. He said, pray that you escape all of these things that are going to happen. And I am told that there wasn't a Christian parish in Jerusalem when Rome sacked Jerusalem because they understood this passage of Scripture and they got out when they saw the armies coming. Now think about this. He says, run to the hills. Run and do all these things to escape what was coming. If Jesus comes again, when he comes again, is it going to help me to run to a mountain? It's not going to help. What's the difference? It's all over. It doesn't help to run and hide in a mountain. But that's what he said to them to do here. And it'd be hard on the pregnant women because if it was on a, or on a Saturday, because on a Saturday the gates were locked. It'd have been tough to get out of the city if it happened on a Saturday or on the Sabbath day. And so he says, pray it doesn't happen on a Sabbath day. And preferably you're not pregnant because it's going to be hard to run when you're pregnant. And so he warns them about all these things, but he says, pray to God that you'll escape all of this so that you will stand before the Son of Man. Now, I don't believe there that he's talking literally standing before Jesus. But what he's saying is that you will meet with Jesus' approval. You will, be, you will meet with your acquittal for sins by Jesus' blood. He says, you will have the favor of Jesus. And therefore, when that judgment comes on Jerusalem, you will still be standing when it's done before the Son of Man. You'll still be there. You'll be serving him. Because he's bringing judgment on Jerusalem. 
Jerusalem not, was not worthy of him. They were wicked. And they were going to be destroyed. And all of the inhabitants, they say that the streets that when Rome attacked Jerusalem, that the streets in Jerusalem flowed with blood knee high. They killed a lot of people, a lot of Jews. But it was all foretold that that was going to happen. But it happened in A.D. 70 to Jerusalem. This was not talking about something future. It's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. That's in context. That's properly interpreted by researching the history and the, the, everything that went on there. And Jesus said, it'll all happen before this generation passes away, his generation pass away. So why do I share that with you this morning? I share for two reasons. One, to show the importance of interpretation and getting it right. But number two is for this. The apostles knew it was going to happen the apostles preached it was going to happen. They understood it. They believed it. And some of them were left to witness it. Because they obeyed Jesus. When Jesus said, watch, stay awake, be alert, be aware, be prepared. They took Jesus seriously. They believed Jesus. And they acted on what he warned them and told them to do. And they weren't weighed down by the cares of the world and by all of the debauchery of the world. Instead, they looked to Jesus. And when it came down, they recognized it. And they got out of harm's way. And they stood before the Son of Man. The principle is the same for you and I. The outcome will be different because it won't be the destruction of Jerusalem. It'll be the destruction of the world when Jesus comes again. But the principle is the same. We don't want to let life's concerns and cares and, and money and material things and, and all of the things that are going on in the world, we don't want that to weigh us down. We don't even want all of the the wars and rumors of wars that are going on and, and the natural destructions and, the, and, and ISIS over there and all of those things that are going on, we don't want those to weigh us down because we know whose we are and we know what our hope is. We've been told by Jesus what our hope is. It's God. Keep our focus on things above. Be ready. Be alert. It all applies to us too. Pray that you're not in the destruction, but pray that you're on the side of salvation. Pray that you will stand before the Son of God. Because we don't know when that time hits for you or I. It could be right now. We could just drop over and it'd be time. It could be a day from now. It could be a week from now. It could be months, years. We don't know. So always watch yourselves. Stay awake. Be alert. Be prepared so that you can stand before the Son of Man. Jesus says that we are to come to him that if we want our burdens lifted. We don't pang over the, the burdens of this world, but we can look to Jesus. And he says, don't be concerned about what's going on in the world so much that it drags you down, but keep your focus on me. And he says, if you do that, then you will be okay. But we have to be united in Christ as our Savior. We have to be immersed into Christ to be in, as our Savior if we have that opportunity. And I don't know where you're at this morning, but if you're there and you have the cares of the world weighing you down and you're not focused on Christ or if you haven't been immersed into Christ and you want to be, 
We're here to help you this morning with that. So won't you come while we stand and sing? I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back, no turning back. Though you go with me, I still will follow. Though you go with me, I still will follow. Though you go with me, I still will follow. No turning back, no turning back. Will you decide now to follow Jesus? Will you decide now to follow Jesus? Will you decide now to follow Jesus? No turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back.